come now to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew chapter 14 beginning at verse 22. Glory to you Lord Jesus Christ. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came, walking toward them on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret, after the people of that place recognized him, they sent word throughout the region and brought all who were sick to him and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Father, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. 
O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Please have a seat. So our gospel reading this morning follows on from what we heard last week with the feeding of the 5,000. You might recall uh, that Jesus was on the shores of Lake Galilee. Uh, if you can recall in your mind, I can certainly picture in my mind, having been there, uh, the, the hillside coming down to the lake uh, and the people spread out there. We're told that there was much grass in that place, which is a pointer to us that the time of year was probably around uh, late winter, uh, into spring. The, the winter rains have given growth to the grass. And so the people are gathered there. Jesus, uh, in seeing all these people, you will well recall, tests the disciples by saying, Oh, well, it's getting late. Said, you better feed these people. And the disciples, dismayed, says, where are we going to get enough food for what may have been as many as 15,000 people? And so it is from just five loaves and two fish that we see this huge mass of people fed. So in this miracle, we see the disciples being tested about their understanding of their capacity compared to the power of God being at work in their situations of life. Our gospel today picks up that Jesus sends the disciples away in the boat. So they're in the the northwest corner, if you like, of Lake Galilee, and they're heading over to the eastern shore of Lake Galilee. Uh, you can see it in the distance. But we're told that as they go out, as they head across the lake, the wind is against them. Now that tells you some important things. Firstly, it tells you that they can't have the benefit of the sails. The wind's against them. And so there they are, rowing the boat into the wind. These guys must have been fit. Because to spend the night rowing a boat into the wind has got to be tiring. Jesus dismisses the people. And we hear what he does on other occasions. And that is, he takes leave to go up the mountain, now it says a mountain, and I can assure you it's more like a, a large hill than a mountain. You know, people from North America come to Brisbane and see Mount Cutha behind Brisbane. And they say, that's not a mountain, that's a bump. And of course, compared to the mountains in North America, uh, Mount Cutha is nothing. And so, as you hear of Jesus went up a mountain, he's not doing rock climbing, he's walking up a largish hill, getting away from the people, and there he spends the night in prayer. Jesus knows that he must maintain an intimate connection with his Father. For it is from his Father and that relationship, that connection, that he has power. Elsewhere, Jesus talks about the fact that he can say and do nothing apart from the Father. And we could go on and have a little conversation about the fact that Jesus is the Word of God made flesh, and of course the source of that Word is the Father. And so there's this intimate connection between the Father and the Son, and Jesus actively maintains and strengthens that relationship. And we also find that whenever that happens, it is either following or as a precursor to times of powerful ministry. All of us in our physical lives know that we need to rest. 
to be refreshed. We can't be active and at it all the time. And so, spiritually, we also need to take time to be refreshed, to be reinvigorated. And it's wonderful to know that over these past months, as our lives have been reshaped as a result of COVID-19, there are many people, both in the parish and further beyond, uh, all the way to London, and we've got Rosemary Gravestock joining us in the service today uh, from the late evening in London, uh, that there are people gathering together at five o'clock each day to stop, to reconnect with God, to pray, to hear from his word. And that sort of activity, I would suggest, is about reinvigorating us spiritually and also building and strengthening our relationship with God. And so, after this time of prayer, Jesus comes down and he's on the shore and the disciples are way out there. Oh, a problem? Well, to you and I, yes. But remember that Jesus is part of the Trinity that was at work to part the seas in the freeing of the Israelites from Egypt. So what does Jesus do here? Well, he walks out to them on the water. Now one of the things that's always intrigued me with this, I don't have a problem with Jesus' ability to walk on water. My ability to walk on water is zero. And I think everybody else here would share that. But it's always intrigued me as I listen to this story, what's it like to walk on water? And more importantly, what's it like to walk on rough water? Do you walk up and down over the waves? Because we're told it was windy, so you've got waves there. Intriguing things. Anyway. Apart from my flights of fancy, we hear Jesus arriving early in the morning to the disciples. They see Jesus coming. And what's their response? Well, what's your response when you experience something of the ordinary? Because that's what the disciples are doing. Something that does not fit into their understanding of the world and how things work. They had no experience or understanding of Jesus or anyone else walking on water. So what's their immediate response? They respond out of the framework of their understanding and they say, well, that must be a ghost because flesh and blood can't walk on water, but a ghost could, a ghost not having flesh and blood. And so they cry out in fear, thinking that what they were experiencing was a ghost. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Don't worry guys, it's me. And then he says something very important. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And if we take anything away from today's service, I want you to take that away. Do not be afraid. Now, the way Jesus says this is important. He's not saying it in a dismissive way. Ah, oh, don't be afraid. It's actually a command. The, the text of the Greek tells us that it's in the emphatic sense. So Jesus is ordering them, stop being afraid. And it's not the only time that Jesus tells the disciples not to give in to fear. And as we think about that word fear, we're reminded that elsewhere in Scripture, we're reminded that love and fear don't go together. Because if we know that we are loved, then what happens to fear? It goes. 
And so to express fear is actually to express that we are out of relationship with God, that we're not loved. We don't have God's love caring for us. But Jesus says, do not fear, you are loved. Do not forget that you are deeply loved. And that's the important thing I would encourage you to remember. Do not fear, you are deeply loved by God. You are deeply loved by a God who is able to do far more abundantly than you either ask or imagine. You see, the disciples express their fear out of their framework of understanding. We heard last week that their framework of understanding was challenged in the feeding of the 5,000. And indeed, repeatedly, Jesus challenges the understanding of the disciples, the understanding that we have of the character and nature of Jesus, the character and nature of God. Because as followers of Christ, we are to live according to the values and ways of the kingdom. And the kingdom says you are deeply loved and all that you need can and will be provided for. Do not be afraid. Peter says, Lord, if it is you, Command me to, to you on the water. Peter is sceptical. If it is you. Now, something that we find that Jesus is very clear on is that he knows who he is. Peter, on the other hand, is still getting used to it. If it is you, tell me to come to you. And so Jesus says, come. Now, this is where we're reminded of what a character Peter is. Not only will he say things that he may later regret, but he will act on that which he says. He gets out of the boat and starts walking to Jesus. Who identifies with Peter? Does anyone say, yeah, I'd be with Peter, I'll, I'll go. Well, I think it's easy <laughs> sitting here on, the, on dry land. Remember, the wind is still here. The boat is still tossing around. Getting out. You know, if it's rough water, I'll hang on. Thank you. But here, Peter gets out and starts walking to Jesus. And then he notices something. Do you remember what he notices? He noticed the wind. Where are you, Peter? The situation that he had got himself into, the reality of it, rekindled the fear. And what did the fear do? It pulled him down, caused him to sink. And what does he do in the midst of that? This is important because Peter does something that so often humans forget to do. Peter cries out, Lord, save me! And Jesus responds immediately and raises him up. And what a wonderful image that is. There is Peter and Jesus holding hands, walking on the water back to the boat. Because that's the implications of what we're reading here. Peter and Jesus holding hands, going back to the boat. In the storms of life, whose hand do we put our hand in? You know, I'm reminded of that wonderful old song, put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the waters. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Do we ever let go of the hand of Jesus? Do we ever forget to reach out our hands to Jesus? I'm sure there's times when we do. There's certainly times when I know I have. But we come as a people rejoicing and celebrating that Jesus is the one 
who reaches out to us in the storms of life, calls our fears to be quiet and reassures us of the reality of his love. And so, when they get into the boat, they worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. I find that intriguing. They haven't got it yet. They thought he might be, but now, oh, you really are. There seems to have been an element of doubt there in the disciples. And they're growing in this new experience. Uh, we thought last week about the, uh, the growing of things and we thought about the mustard seed. Do you remember those mustard seed that we saw? Fine little specks on that person's hand. And Jesus says, all you need is faith as big as a mustard seed. It's not very much, isn't it? And here, Jesus says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, remember what faith is. We thought of this last week. Faith is the confidence of things unseen. Notice that? It's the confidence of things unseen, the certainty of things yet to come. Do you hear any doubt there? There's no room for doubt with faith. Faith is the confidence of things unseen, the certainty of things yet to come. We proclaim that we are a people of faith. Well, today I'm reminded that my faith is about as big as a mustard seed. And I've got some work to do. Will you help me? Because I'd like to help you. May we be a people growing in faith, coming to have confidence in who Jesus is and what he's able to do in our lives. Our reading finishes with them landing at the land of Gennesaret, which is on the eastern side of the lake. And after the people of that place recognized him, they sent word throughout the region and brought all who were sick to him and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. Remember that woman who had a flow of blood who came touching the hem of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. Did these people have faith? They certainly did. And it stands as something of a contrast to the disciples. May we be a grow as a people of faith and demonstrate that in our lives and carry that out as a message to the world. For we are a people who proclaim the love of God in Christ Jesus and we call people to put their faith and trust in him. May we be a people who clearly demonstrate that faith so others also may come to faith in Christ Jesus. Now to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be ascribed all might, majesty, dominion, and power this day and forevermore. Amen.